Kenya. Okay, now can you hear me? Ah, now can. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding me. Okay. Otherwise, I may finish the whole lecture. Then you got in none. Okay. All right. Ah, now can hear. All right, so uh, we are saying that, okay, the first uh, thing that we wanted to discuss is about the test. Okay, after that, um, we will talk about some revision class, right? Um, so it is not necessary that we will have two hours class today. Okay, as long as I finish what I wanted to say, then we can have our class dismissed. Okay, and usually um, I will not record the session revision session. Okay, but uh, for the good of everybody, especially those students that cannot attend class today, uh, they have a chance lah, to go back to uh, listen, okay, what we are discussing today. Uh, but I will not uh, upload the revision slide. So if you have anything, you can uh, jot down or record down by yourself. Okay, so uh, for your test here, we look at the first question, okay, you actually stand in front, you target, and then you recorded 10 vehicles arriving at your at your site. Okay, this is an arriving time. Okay, we assume that ID is zero. Okay, we assume ID is zero. So you want to find the headway, right? So the headway of the first pair of vehicle that can't come in front of you. If your ID is zero here, that means you have to use 15 minus 2. That is 30. Right, so the first number of uh, headway is 13. Okay, so you ignore what we have here, uh, you ignore everything. If we only have one set, one pair of vehicle, right, you know this is 13 seconds. So if I ask you to find the average, how much will be the average? The average will be 13, right, because you only have one set of data. So here, one pair of vehicles, right, will give you one data. Then here, two, okay, three, four, right, five, uh, six, seven, eight, and then nine. So even you have 10 vehicles, but your headway data set, you will only have nine sets because one pair will need to make up your one data will need one pair of vehicles. So at the end of the day, whatever that you calculated, you have to divide by nine, not 10. I observed that many students, they divide by 10. OK, so and then in two decimal places. OK, so uh, in this case, uh, OK, uh, since um, of course, uh, this question is a bit uh, catchy, OK, a bit catchy. So for those who answer correctly divided by nine, I give two marks. For those answer divided by 10, I give one mark. Huh? OK, so from here, after you get the average headway, you inverse the average headway uh, times 3600, then you will get uh, average traffic flow. OK, and then you can calculate the probability of vehicles arrive. So here, if you got it wrong, OK, these three questions are together. If you got it wrong, the first one, everything is wrong. OK, so if you divide by 10, OK, I will give you one point, one point, one point if you calculated correctly. So my marking scheme have two sets. One is a, why is it divided by 10 and another one divided by 9? OK, question four, OK, we have a study on the highway shows this is a relationship, right? So we wanted to know the capacity of the road. This question is very simple. This is the relationship of U. Okay, this question actually uh, adapted huh? or we say amended from the tutorial question. I remember there is one tutorial question like this. So I don't understand why student cannot do. Okay, this you should score. Right? So you want to know the capacity, very simple. Q equals to KU. And then you differentiate DQ, DK equals zero and then plug in the K value and get what is the capacity of the road? All right. Next one, question five to seven. OK, I found out that also a lot of students, they can't do this question. OK, this is about the deterministic Q, queuing theory. Uh, this is also adapted from the tutorial. If you can't answer this test paper, 
that means you didn't actually do your tutorial. This is an alarming sign to you. For those, uh, you look back your test paper. If you can't answer these, these few questions, that means you already ignore the tutorial question. This is very dangerous. Okay, you have to make sure that in your preparation for your FA, you have to, okay, you have to read your tutorials. Okay, of course, those that we have already tested, like for example, tutorial one, tutorial two, okay, you do not need to go through. Okay, so that means that uh, you have another two tutorials, right? Tutorial three and four. So make sure you go through them, make sure you understand each and every question. Okay, I am really shocked, okay, to see students cannot answer because this is totally same as what we have covered. Only the function I have changed it. Only the function I have changed it, right? The things that I request also the same, like longest queue. How we get the longest queue? Okay, so now you know the arrival rate. You know the departure rate, but this is the rate. Okay, this is the rate. So what you need to know, you need to get the cumulative. You need to know the arrival, uh, cum cumulative arrival. That is what we call arrival uh, equation. So what you do, you have to integrate this lambda. And then departure rate also the same. You have to integrate this mu. Okay, then you wanted to know the Q. How, what is the Q? Q means that anything that comes in, did not go up, it will become the queue, right? You will queue in the system. You go to the, you go to the FGO office, right? You want to register some subject, for example. You arrive at the office. If at the moment you are processed, that means uh, the, the, the clerk, okay, directly call you and uh, job on your form, okay, receive your form, you can go. That means you are not queuing, you are processing, right? But if you arrive at the office, but wow, well, you know, few of the students are in front of you, you have to queue. So that means you arrive, but you didn't depart. So that different means that you have to use arrival cumulative curve minus the departure cumulative curve, right? When you got this, okay, you want the longest queue, so you need to do DQ, DQ, this queue, uh, not our flow rate queue, DQ. Okay, DQ, D, T equals to zero. You find the time T when the time is the longest. Okay, then you plug in back, you got the DQ, DT maximum. Okay, so longest Q. When will be? So you need to find the T. All right, then what is the maximum Q? You just plug in back. Okay, estimate the total delay. Okay, total delay means that you have to estimate the area under the curve. So you have to integrate again, double integration to your arrival rate, or you integrate one more time to your cumulative arrival curve, right? And your departure curve. Then you can minus and got it. Okay. Uh, student asked me about uh, the, the unit. Uh, I told you already, unit is important. Uh, okay. Unit. Okay, the unit is important. Vehicle per minute means that you are finding the average. Okay, so I want a total delay. That means vehicle dash minute. Okay, so if you give me uh, the wrong unit, then I have to minus one mark. Uh, okay. Okay, part B, uh, question eight, differentiate capacity and maximum service flow rate. Okay, this is even shocking. Uh. <laughs> Many students cannot answer this. Uh. Hey, this is already in the notes. Uh. How come you cannot uh, uh, answer? Capacity is just, yeah, capacity means that the maximum flow rate, uh, maximum flow rate that a road, okay, uh, that can actually accommodate. You can answer like this, right? So that will be the capacity. 
what is the maximum service flow rate? Okay, so maximum service flow rate means that we are looking at the level of service. It's a boundary. The, the maximum service flow rate is a maximum flow that can be accommodated by the road for the specific level of service. Let's say, okay, level of service B is 1008, right? C is 2000, okay? D is 2100, so on and so forth. It's so very simple. This is stated inside the notes. Okay, so I didn't say that you cannot copy the notes. Okay, students uh, might might be very scared of plagiarism, right? Uh, some they ask me, they ask uh, whether if they use the answer, or maybe let's say I say define here, define capacity. Okay, so in my notes, I have already defined that definition. I say capacity is the maximum flow rate that can be accommodated by a road. So if they copy this whole sentence into the, uh, as their answer, is this considered plagiarism or not? Okay, okay, so this is not plagiarism because this is the definition for the capacity. If you don't use these words, what else words you want to use? Right? And then some student is funny, right? In their reference, they cite notes. Note is their reference. <laughs> it's fine. Notes is for you to read. After you read, then of course you know capacity is the maximum flow chart, uh, flow rate. So how can I say you, you plagiarism? This is not plagiarism. Okay, so you don't worry any information that you got it from the notes. That is not considered plagiarism. Plagiarism is happen when your answer and your friend answer is exactly the same. Each word, each word is totally the same. Like for example, here differentiate road capacity and maximum service for it. If you do it by yourself and your friend do it by yourself, even though both of you copy or get the answer from the, the notes, okay? The way that you express it will be a little bit different. It won't be exactly 100% the same, okay? So if you, you are not plagiarism, you are not copying, you are not uh, cheating, so don't worry about that, okay? So you just get it from the notes. I won't say that you plagiarism the notes, okay? There is no such thing because the note is what I give to you. But if let's say, you copy from some Google answer, uh, then you have to, okay? You have to cite it as a reference, okay? Because what I have written in my notes, I know what are they, right? I'm very familiar with my own notes, okay? But when I look at the sentence, I know this is not the sentence from the notes, it's sentence from somewhere else, okay? But at the same time, your friend also refer to Google and he also copied down that same sentence. Uh, so in this case, you might not know, right? Uh, when I mark, I know. So in this case, you have to cite. All right. Uh, so so these are the difference uh, be between the plagiarism and the cheating. Uh, of course, uh, we will know when we mark and we look at the sentence structure, everything, we, we, will, we will get the same feeling if they are the same. Okay, so don't worry if I ask you to Get the definition, you just write down the definition. Okay, definition is, is uh, worldwide used. Everybody, when you ask any of the traffic engineer, any of the student of traffic engineering, you ask them what is the capacity. This is the standard answer that they give. Okay, so here the key point is differentiate. So you have to differentiate. Okay, capacity is the maximum of that road. Okay, maximum service flow rate is the boundaries, uh, they actually specify the boundary of each of the levels. And if, if you are, uh, another point that you can say is that road capacity usually is the maximum service flow rate for level of service E, uh, then that is fine. Okay, uh, question number nine is a class two, two lane highway. Okay, uh, we wanted to find what is the level of service. So this one, I think uh, if you can't get the answer, you, you have to repeat one more time uh, because this is very simple, straightforward, right? If you see all the 10 questions to be fair, uh, uh, to be fair to me, okay, all the 10 questions, only question one is a bit catchy. Catchy, but not difficult, 
right? So you don't don't let me catch you. Divide by nine, divide by ten. Others questions are so simple, right? Everything you can get it from the note, and uh, if you are familiar with your tutorial, it doesn't actually have any difficulty level for you. We have several students that score full or near to full full points, uh, okay? But there are many students uh, that cannot do well. Okay, question 10, uh, we wanted to design a highway and expressway, right? And then I give you the AADT, I give you the peak PHF, I give you the D factor, okay? The free flow speed and everything. And then I want you to find out what is the number of lanes that required. This is also from the tutorial, right? So if I want level of service C and I want level of service D, okay, so this round, uh, when I mark your answer, uh, I close one eye. Uh, because here, okay, for level of service C, we got uh, the number of lanes is four lane. Okay, so your answer should be four lane. Four lane in one direction, or you have to mention two lanes, uh, sorry, uh, eight lanes for both directions. Some of the students, their answer is eight lanes. Okay, if your answer is eight lanes, it should be wrong. Because the answer should be falling. When I give you this directional distribution, means that I want you to find out what is the number of lanes in one direction only. In one direction. I didn't ask you to find out whether we should put single carriageway or dual carriageway. If single carriageway, then you say, uh, eight lane, that means four lane in each direction. So anyhow, your answer should be four lane in each direction, n equals to four. And for levels, with D, n should be equal to three. So the answer should be four lane and three lane, or you say eight lanes in two direction and six lanes in two direction. If your answer is directly six lanes, or your direction is uh, directly eight lanes, it should be wrong. Okay, because we won't say like this. Uh, traffic engineer, we won't say like that. Because if you say eight lanes, automatically people will think that your eight lane refer to one direction. Okay, you have to say eight lane in, in two direction. Okay, or we say four lane, n equals to four lane in one direction. You can just say like that. No need to add, up, add it up. No need to think about the other, the other direction. Okay, so this round I... I, I close one eye uh, for, for students. As long as you got my magic number, six and eight, then uh, I, I six and eight or three or four, I got you right up. Okay, so um, any question on your, on the marking, okay, or anything that I have uh, calculated wrongly, uh, total out or anything, you can PM me, okay, after the class, then I will check one more time. Okay, and discuss with you. All right. So this has uh, passed already. Okay. Um, okay. Next one is. Okay. Now we can start our. Now we can start our revision. Okay. So let us look at the revision. Okay, where is it? Okay. It's here. All right, so this is our uh, revision today. Okay, so we look at here. Uh, okay, so revision. Okay, the first, we will go through a bit now. Uh, okay, what is the summary of our lecture? Okay, for this uh, 12, 12 or 13 weeks. Okay, we have a total of nine lectures. Okay, and I have mentioned to you already. Um, <coughs> oh, okay. Um, you, you give me five minutes, yeah.
Okay, so uh, we have we have gone through the nine lectures, right? So we have to anyhow come back, okay, to this OBE outcome. So uh, number one, identify issues and challenges in transportation systems planning and design. Explain basic traffic flow theory and parameters. Plan, analyze, and design for transportation facilities. And finally, illustrate the design and uh, construction of a roadway. Okay, so uh, fall back uh, everything. Okay, the assessment will fall back to these uh, four outcomes. And um, okay, if you if you didn't actually get anything, okay, after this. Uh, to 12 or 13 weeks, at least, uh, at least you need to grasp okay, the key points that I, I'm going to uh, discuss with you all. Okay, the key points, lah, okay, your takeaway, lah, whatever that you need to know. Okay, so in the chapter one, you should, after you learn chapter one, after you walk out from this course, you should already know, okay, what is the meaning of mobility accessibility, intermodal, multimodal, right? transport equity, electronic throw correction, and uh, electronic road pricing. Okay, so you should need to know what is the difference between mobility and accessibility. Okay, it seems like contradicted, isn't it? Mobility, like uh, when I talk about the road hierarchy, Right, I talk about mobility and accessibility. If you want to design your road to be high mobility, high mobility means that the vehicles, the drivers can enjoy high speed. As compared to accessibility, accessibility means that we talk about road park, uh, parking, okay, uh, roadside parking, or maybe the uh, in the building parking and so on. So that is the accessibility. Right, so mobility and accessibility is different. OK, you have a lot of highways. You can make the people arrive, uh, go to anywhere in a very short time. That is what we say accessibility. But if your highway is terrifically, seriously jammed, that means you restrict the mobility. OK, so these are different. Intermodal and multimodal. OK, uh, multimodal means that you have multiple nodes, modes. You have different kind of modes for you to go in between of origin to destination. For example, from here, I want to go Singapore from KL to Singapore, right? I can choose many different modes. For example, I can drive, I can take airplane, I can take train, even I can use a cruise, right? So this is multi-model. Intermodal means that you use different kind of modes in between of a trip. For example, okay, from uh, from from my house, right? I walk to a station nearby, then I take the LRT. After that, from the LRT, okay, station, I uh, walk to the office. So that is uh, what we call intermodal, right? Transport equity. Transport equity means that uh, we wanted to look at uh, fairness, okay, fairness uh, given to everybody. Uh, so that is the meaning of uh, transport equity, right? Like disabled, they should have their own uh, parking, okay? So this is equity. And many of the time, the equity, we will, uh, we will associate them, okay, with the um, example like the uh, road pricing. Okay, so road pricing, how can we deal with transport equity? Because we are going to price away, okay, those to, uh, those drivers who are not uh, willing to pay. Okay, electronic road pricing and electronic toll collection is what is different. Okay, so when you drive on the highway, right, you go to the toll. This one, everybody can understand. That is the electronic toll. That is a toll, right? And this toll, the objective why they want to collect the toll is for the reimbursement or for their investment. Okay, when they make the road, they put in the investment. So they have to collect the toll to get back their investment. And as well as you know, uh, for their uh, maintenance of the road. Okay, so this is why you need to pay the toll. Okay, so if you pay cash, right, 
at the toll, that means you are not using electronic. But if you uh, pay touch and go, you pay start, smart tag, uh, you pay the, the uh, RFID, using the RFID, right? Uh, an RFID tag in front of your dashboard on your windscreen. Okay, on your windscreen, okay, when they when you pass through, they just uh, scan it and then you pay by your touch and go e-wallet. So these are the example of electronic toll collection. Okay, electronic road pricing, the ERP use the same technology. Okay, and even some of them is uh, more advanced, like they don't have gantry. Okay, example in Singapore, you don't have any gantry. You do not need to slow down. Okay, you can travel with your usual speed, 60, 70 kilometer per hour. Okay, so this is electronic road pricing, but the objective of their pricing is that it's not to collect toll from you. The objective is that you use that particular road, which is a busy road, and it is going to cost congestion. So that's why they charge you on that congestion pricing. Okay, so their objective is not to collect the toll, but the objective is to price away, okay? Try to discourage those drivers that do not want to play, to pay, okay? To go to uh, other modes or other roads and so on, okay? So this is the difference. So after the chapter one, you should minimally, okay? What we are talking today is minimum, you know? Uh, what is the minimum that you need to know? Okay, chapter two and chapter three, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, actually go through it uh, a lot because uh, chapter two and chapter three is not covered uh, inside our inside our uh, FA. Okay, so I believe you have uh, gone through a lot. Huh? Okay, for your chapter two and three. So we focus on those that are uh, covered in the final assessment okay so chapter four is about transport uh, planning so transport planning is a very important uh, chapter in uh, the future in your idp one when you do the traffic impact assessment subgroup okay so you are going to come back to this uh, chapter four okay so for a model for us to establish a model we need to have two things one is the zone to describe the activity. Why do we need to describe the activity? Because when there is an activity, an economic activity, then only we have the needs to travel. For example, now everyone stay at home, right? When you want to buy things, you go shopping. Okay, when you want to buy food, you go for panda. So do you have the need to go up? If you don't have the need to go up, then you won't create traffic. You, yourself, me and myself, right? We are people who create the traffic. Okay, so if you don't have the activity, then of course you don't have traffic on the road. Okay, so this is very direct, okay? Uh, transport network, you must have a network. Network means that you must have a road and a junction. So on the model itself, the road is called the link and then the junction is called the nodes. So you have the link and the node and you have the zone to tell you how much your traffic is coming up, is coming in. So you make up that model. And from this model, we can calculate what is the level of service for each of the mode, uh, bus, mode, uh, bus, okay, uh, public transport, LRT, okay. And uh, we also can look at uh, vehicles, for example. Okay, so this this cost we focus on the vehicles more. Okay, vehicle traffic. Okay, so this is the transport network. As I mentioned, you have link and you have nodes. Link represent the roads, nodes represent junction. And then you have the TAZ. The TAZ is the uh, zones. Okay, zones will represent the uh, activity. Okay, zone, and we assume a centroid. Centroid is an assumption, okay, that all the traffic is coming out from there and all the traffic is going to return to that. That is the meaning of centroid. Okay, so in the travel demand model, the objective is to predict how much traffic will be on the road in the future. And this always, uh, we use this only when we have like new project. 
new project at the established area or new project at a new area. So we wanted to predict. When you know how much traffic is going to be on the road, then you can design the number of lanes, right? Based on the level of service that you forecast. Uh, that is what our question number 10 in our test. Okay, you know the traffic on the road, you, you define or you decide the level of service that you want, then you can know the number of lanes. That is the ultimate objective of us, traffic engineer doing the travel demand model. Okay, so we have four steps here. Trip generation, okay, indicates how many trips are generated. Trip distribution, where are the trips going and coming from? Okay, mode split, what modes that they use? Bus, LRT, okay, MRT, BRT. Okay, or they use a vehicle. So in our study, in our lecture here, we only focus on vehicles, right? So we wanted to take away those not belong to vehicle, right? And lastly is a traffic assignment, which road that they are using, okay? So uh, trip gen, trip distribution, trip assignment, okay? So we focus on mode choice, huh? okay? So uh, students, you have to be smart, huh? Okay, why there are so many models, uh, but I focus on mode split. Okay, so you have to understand uh, okay, the meaning behind this. Okay, so the prevailing concept of this uh, mode choice is that we use the logic model. So I have to tell you about this utility if I've forgotten to tell you about it. The first step for us to do the logic model is that we must have the utility function. And this utility and this uh, logic model uh, is proposed by a Nobel laureate, but I've forgotten his name. I think it's Michael Florin. Okay, Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Michael Florin. I attended uh, one of his uh, key keynote speech, I think in one of the conference, I think in uh, Dalian maybe, okay, Dalian, China. So he came uh, to a conference to give a keynote lecture okay <laughs> so it's a big guy right so this guy he talked about choices it is not on transport he is not a transport guy he is an economic guy so the utility function here that he mentioned is not only restricted to transport it is applicable to any type of choices that you make for example you wanted to decide later lunch what you want to eat so there must, you must already build some utility in your heart, in your mind, how to measure everything. Right? For example, if you wanted to buy a car, there are so many cars okay, on the, uh, uh, in the market. Right? You have Proton, even Proton, you have so many different uh, choices. Or even I say, okay, maybe we say computer, or maybe we say handphone. Okay? This is something that is close to you, right? If you want to buy a handphone, there are so many different brands that function seems like almost the same. OK, different price, uh, different uh, prices, right? Different price and so on. So when you want to choose to buy a handphone, what are the factors that you consider? You consider the function of the handphone, right? What is the function that it has? OK, Internet, whether it has 4G, it has 5G. Okay, and then whether it's a multiple SIM card or single SIM card, right? Whether you can expand the memory or not, how much is the battery capacity? Okay, what is the size of the screen? Okay, what is the price? So these are the factors that you consider. And then you will build the utility function in your heart. And at the end of the day, you will choose the one that you like. So similar concept apply on the transport. When you want to choose what mode of transport to use, let's say later I want to go meet my friend. So you will have the utility in your mind. And this utility are actually uh, explain what are the factors that can affect your choice. For example, travel time, travel costs, okay, uh, access and egress time, waiting time, service frequency. Okay, so these are the factors. OK, that you may consider. So at the end of the day, you will build something like this utility in your heart. 
and then you will choose. So you will choose. OK, for you, your choice is yes or no. So you are 50 50, right? If you have two choices, whether you want to take the bus or you want to take the car. Right? But for many people, right? When you when we think about a population, then we wanted to uh, find the probability of them choosing certain mode, let's say car. Then we use the logic model. OK, if you ask me whether there is only one model available, of course it's not. OK, we have many other models, but logic model is the most fundamental one. So you need to know. So logic model is explained, expressed in this equation. P equals to the exponential of VI. VI is your utility. Sometimes this VI, we can also use the symbol U. UI, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's just a symbol. Divided by the total exponential of the UI. Okay, so this, if you still cannot know how to use this equation, okay, please, okay, do your example. I give you an example already in the class and also your tutorial. Okay, appreciate them properly. Another thing that I wanted to say, okay, now you see, you see here the utility, okay, 1 minus 0 0.1 TT auto minus 0 0.05 TC. Then we would be able to get some percentage, right? How many is going for car? How many is going for bus? How many is using walking, right? So you can get this. Okay, so this value, the travel time value that is given will affect your choice. If let's say now I say, OK, travel time or bus. Last time you need to travel 40 minutes. OK, 40 minutes because old bus. Now I replace the bus with a new bus, for example. OK, and then the speed of the bus is better. And now the travel time become 20 minutes cut by half. So will this uh, affect your choice? Yes, it will because your travel time has reduced, right? So your utility will become better, okay? More interest, more attractive, right? And then when you calculate the probability when your U is better or your V is better, then your probability will get larger, okay? So in that case, you will have, uh, you will you will have bigger portion of uh, travelers who use the bus, okay? So the choice is depending on the value of these factors. If you are able to improve, for example, in some of the city here, like for example, Petaling Jaya, okay, they have free bus. KL, they also have the free bus, like um, Go KL, okay, in, Bu in Bukit Bintang area. So when you're, you have free bus, that means your travel cost of the bus becomes zero. Okay, so when it becomes zero, then you calculate and see how much will be your probability of bus increase. It will certainly increase. OK, because this is negative. So their relationship is negative, right? When your cost increase, your utility reduce. When your cost reduce, your utility increase. OK, although it's not proportionate, they are not proportionate, but they have this relationship. All right. So I hope you appreciate what I say. OK, then we come to chapter five. OK, chapter five is about survey. And uh, in the survey, we have two parts that we look at. One is the observational survey. One is the participatory survey. OK, so observational survey means that you do not involve the person or the vehicles that you want to survey. You just stand at the roadside uh, quietly and then observe the movement of the traffic, then you count uh, whatever you want to do the count. OK, you want to count the volume, you count. You want to get the speed, you do it. Right. So that is observational survey. Uh, participatory survey means that you have to involve the people who is being surveyed. And normally this include like interview, questionnaire, OK, discussion and travel diary. Uh, most important nowadays is questionnaire. Uh, OK. Supplement to the observational survey, this one 
extra. Okay, so I have uh, discussed with you about the two types of survey, questionnaire survey, right? So uh, one is what we call the review preference. Another one is what we call the stated preference. Okay, I'm not sure whether some of the students here, maybe they, they are not here when I talk about this. So I think it is good, okay, that uh, I repeat one more time. Okay, so this review preference analysis means what? It quantifies your opinion or your preference based on the experience. Okay, to discover the user opinion. We can use a ranking exercise or we can use a Likert skill uh, statement. So what is the meaning of this uh, Likert skill statement? So this is the example that I showed you last time, right? That uh, this is an ongoing, um, ongoing um, questionnaire that we do in the in the uh, Kuching, okay, in Kuching Sarawak. And if you read now, uh, this is the latest project, uh, okay. So uh, if we see here, uh, okay. So this is what we say the Likert skill, okay. This is a Likert skill. You have from five skill this is five skill this is one okay and then this is five so you can have uh from strongly disagree okay to agree right so this is we give it one and then uh this one we give it five okay so here is two la okay, how come like that okay three and then four okay so this is a little still I will use ART if fuel price increase, if car parking charge is expensive, okay? Uh, feeder bus service is provided. So this is asking your opinion, okay? Whether you, you agree or not, okay? If you have already experienced, okay? Let's say I change this to L, uh, LRT, or maybe I change this to BRT. You have already experienced a BRT. So you can say that whether you agree or not that, you know, the park and ride service uh, facilities is very important for you to assess, okay, the BRT. Okay, so these, these are the things that we have to uh, consider. So this is what we say perception and attitude survey. So you have one to five. So this type is called the review preference. So everything is based on your opinion, okay? You have experienced it, you give your opinion, okay? So this is what we say, the uh, review preference, okay? Stated preference means that you quantify preference that are still not available. Like for example, our ART here. ART is not yet in coaching. No one has taken ART before. Me, myself also know. Okay, although we already have such application in Johor, there is some planning that uh, for us to go and visit okay, the ART system in Johor, but due to MCO, it was not. Okay, it was not uh, on until now. So something that I haven't experienced, uh, for example, in Malaysia, I haven't experienced high speed rail. So you ask me my opinion, whether I will choose to use a uh, high speed rail or not, if it is here. Okay, you ask me whether I will use the ART or not when it is here. So this is what we call stated preference. So stated preference is based on the hypothetical situation. You tell me the situation, but those are hypothetical. Okay, for example here. Okay. So ART, I expect that the travel time will be 15 minutes. The travel cost will be 2 ringgit 50 cent. Access and egress time will be 20 minutes. Okay, waiting time will be 12 minutes and uh, service frequency will be 15 minutes. So these are not there yet. The, old, the ART is not there. So these are all the hypothetical situation. And there are many hypothetical situation that I can set. For example, here in this Okay, in this example, right? So here, this is the one of the set. Another choice is that I mean, change the service frequency become eight minutes. Another choice is that I can change this. 
Can you see the travel time becomes 60? Here is 50. Now it becomes 60. Okay. Previously was two ringgit 50 cent travel cost. What if the travel cost now become one ringgit? Will you choose? Will you choose ART or you will choose the car? So this is the stated preference. You haven't gone through the system yet, right? But I give you some hypothetical condition, the factors, and then I make you choose. So this is what you think. You think I, I think I will choose ART. But at the end of the day, when ART is there, whether what you think will translate to your action or not, that is another story, okay? So now, so that is, there will be limitation. Now. Any tools that we use, there will be a limitation. Okay, so now you can see if we have scenario three compared to scenario four, what is the difference is that here, this is 20 minutes, right, for access and egress time. And then this is four minutes and, okay, so each of the scenario, they are different. So we give different combination. So this is what we call in mathematics, this is experimental. Have different factors and you come up with different combinations. How we find the good combination, com combination, how we find that we will need to use some tools to help us. Or you can actually list down all the possible combinations and then you choose a few combinations that you think is good to test. Okay, so for stated preference, we use experimental design to design our questionnaire. But for the review preference, we don't we don't use experimental design. We have liquid steel, and usually is a statements. Okay, and then we consider whatever factors that we wanted to consider. Okay, so that is uh, for chapter five. The key point, right? And then chapter six, that is uh, highway engineering. So uh, the main thing about this is the highway design, okay? Vertical alignment, horizontal cross-sectional, and don't forget your interchange, interchange and intersections, okay? So highway design is a 3D problem, but when we actually do the design, it becomes a 2D, right? Because we have stations, remember stationing representing your X direction and then your elevation representing your Y axis. OK, so it becomes you project it on the paper, it becomes a 2D problem. Vertical alignment is in the profile view, right? And then horizontal alignment is in the plan view. So uh, this thing you have to remember. Lah. OK, and then when we wanted to design a uh, cross sectional is is a cut across the plane of the highway and we design the cross-sectional elements like the lane weave, super elevation, median shoulders and so on. Okay, so this is cross-sectional elements. Now, of course, when we do the design, okay, we need to have the design vehicle, okay, to see whether they are able to whether they are able to, you know, uh, pass through or uh, navigate your curve, okay, and whether they are able to climb their slope, okay? So this is the meaning of a design vehicle. We need that, okay, when we design. Another thing that we need to have is the design speed, okay? Design speed is the speed that we select to establish specific uh, minimum geometry. Okay, uh, student, uh, please do not message me uh, during my lecture. Okay, I cannot look at your, your question and answer you in the meantime, I give the lecture. If you have anything after I finish the lecture, you can PM me. Okay, don't PM me during my lecture because I can't reply to you, right? Um, okay, so for design speed, okay, design speed is a speed selected to establish specific minimum geometry design elements for a particular section of highway. And we know that this design speed is very important. Okay, design speed has to come 
have to also consider the design uh, vehicles as well. Uh. Okay, these are two important uh, input. Okay, sometimes that, you know, we can't, we, you didn't see, it, you already uh, ignore it, right? But these are two important uh, inputs in our road design. Okay, so this design speed, as I told you, at the end of the day, you have to turn it to change, uh, convert it into the speed limit. And the relationship between the design speed and the speed limit is always is that rule of thumb. Huh? A rule of thumb means that it is not principle, but it is usually how people do. That is the meaning of rule of thumb. Okay, so uh, design speed and the speed limit is that speed limit is equal to the design speed minus 10 kilometer per hour. Okay, so your design speed, if it is 90, your poster speed limit, you can post anything below 90. You can have 80. Uh. Usually people will use 80. But if you think that you want 70, you can do it as long as it's below the design speed. So we will, our curvature of the road, okay, our, our curve, uh, our radius of our curve, whether it's vertical curve or horizontal curve, okay, we have to make sure that, okay, uh, the curve that we design conform to this design speed. Because this design speed is what we assume uh, the speed of the vehicles on our road. So if I design the speed 70 km per hour and you as a driver who drive at 80 or 90 km per hour, so what does it mean? You are over speed. So over speed when you navigate through my curve, of course you will fail. There is a probability you will fail. I would say there is 100%, right? So when when you drive it field, that means what? Accident will happen. So that is why it is important for you to abide to the speed limit, especially when it comes to the uh, place where you have slopes and you have curves. Okay, when it means 90, you have to slow it down to 90. Right, so this is the meaning of design speed. How do we choose the design speed? We can choose based on some manual, right? For example, we can refer to the road manual at flat terrain, we have 110 and mountainous terrain, we have 80 km per hour. This is just a, a very general guideline. Okay, many of the time we have to see the stretch of the road that we design. Okay, and we have to check our design speed towards the safe side distance. Right, whether with that particular design speed, are we able to provide, okay, uh, that type of uh, uh, curve, okay, that type of uh, safe side distance so that our people, okay, our driver can see properly and stop in front of the obstacle to prevent crashing, okay. Of course, uh, uh, for the highway engineer, you are liable, okay, you are liable for the uh, design that you have done, not like traffic engineer, right? If we do projection, uh, traffic projection, we, we are not liable for the numbers. Okay, if we say that in the future we project there will be 2,000 vehicles on the road, but at the end of the day there is only 1,005, right? We are we will not get sued for that. Okay, but if you are highway, if you are a highway engineer, you design the road, and you didn't follow the specification, you didn't ensure that the minimum stopping site distance achieved. Okay, and there is an accident happen, you can be sued. Okay, so this is. You have to be very careful. So when you choose your design speed, you have to always check whether that design speed can pass. Okay, your together with your uh, lane, uh, I mean your your curve. Okay, the radius of your curve, the length of your curve, whether it is sufficient for you to provide certain uh, stopping side distance for our vehicles. Okay, so. One important uh, for the, is this one, uh, okay? okay. <laughs> one important uh, equations, right? Uh, because we know L is equal to Ka. So if you know the, if you know the K, if you know the A, you will be able to decide the length of the curve, okay? So based on that, you will be able to know whether your design speed is sufficient or not. Okay, usually we will have the design speed first, then only we check. Okay, whether it can pass through your SSD or not. Okay, and remember this K value, 
where we usually use it okay for our uh, road design we can find it from our table right so you do not need to calculate okay next one is your horizontal curve i think this is uh, during the lecture and as well as the tutorial i have stressed it a lot that this ms is one very important factor okay that will govern the length of our curve and the radius uh, of our curve horizontal curve okay to see whether it is sufficient to provide the ssd or not this one i have stressed it many times because this ms okay middle ordinate okay is the distance that you necessary that you need to clear okay to ensure that this area does not have any obstacle you know does not have the tree does not have the lamp post does not have the traffic sign devices okay traffic signatures like okay you don't have anything here to block your view of your driver so this i have mentioned many times okay and i also explain to you what is the difference between the ms and the m so you can see here the ms you can measure here the m m is only here this part okay so from the side of the road to the center or whatever okay to the center if let's say your center is here then you can be anywhere but your ms is from the center of your road that is your driving driving uh, path the center of your driving path okay so this is what is uh, this is a different okay and then you have the r and the rv okay r is from the center of the road i told you already r is from the geometry so the geometry we look at the geometry the center of the road okay and then we have the rv rv is from the center of the traveling path okay from the center of the traveling path so this is what we call rv so the relationship between r and rv is that r is equal to rv plus w over 2 so w is the width of the lane okay so these are two two important things uh, that you need to uh, differentiate it well right in our vertical and horizontal design okay so please go through your tutorial form make sure that you understand okay you know how and what each of these question in your tutorial form make sure you understand each equation uh, no, each question okay if the solution you don't understand why they want to do this why they want to do that then you can pm me okay i can explain to you Okay, or you can watch back the video in the video uh, during the class. I have explained it in detail for each of the question. So make sure you understand properly. Okay, so that is the key point for lecture six. So these are the equations. Lah. So no problem for you to use the equation as long as you understand what this symbol means. Okay, so make sure if you if you do the revision when you do the revision you write down okay what this symbol means if you if you don't understand right? if any symbol that you don't understand you can always pm me okay before the final assessment not during okay okay chapter seven chapter seven is about the s4 and the aggregates Okay, so inside there we can see these are the important aspects of road aggregate properties. So the aggregate that we choose to construct our road and the aggregates that we choose to construct our building is different. Right, certainly is different. So these are the aspects or the properties that we want for our aggregate. Okay, then next one is a bituminous mixed design when our aggregate mixed with the asphalt cement. Okay, we are going to get the asphalt concrete. So, uh, what are the cri uh, characteristics that we want? Okay, for asphalt concrete, these are the uh, uh, key points: durability, stability, workability. Okay. Next one is chapter eight. So, in your chapter eight, uh, we have covered uh, two types of well. 
I only, only give the flexible payment. We have covered two types, right, of the uh, pavement. One is a flexible, another one is a rigid pavement. Okay, so for the flexible pavement design, you should focus on this more. Okay, and also you need to know what is the difference. Okay, between the flexible pavement and the uh, rigid pavement. Okay, so flexible pavement, we have uh, four layers. Subgrade is our uh, the bottom one. Then we have sub base, base and vary. Okay, for the rigid pavement, we only have three layers. Subgrade, base and vary. We don't have the sub base. And I already explained to you in the class, okay, in terms of ability to capture the the stress, the pressure, okay, from the tires or traffic on top. So we will see they are different, okay. So each of them they have their pro and cons, lah, okay. But ninety five percent of our road in Malaysia is using flexible pavement, so we pay attention to them. Okay, so these are the captures, lah, uh, from the notes. You can go through, okay. Uh, this is a rigid pavement, okay. Rigid pavement, and what is the difference, okay? Just now I've mentioned already. What is the difference between the flexible and rigid pavement? This one you need to do a bit of a, a bit of a comparison, okay. Last chapter nine, okay. Chapter nine is basically on construction, right? So these are the important. Steps we have over excavation, formation of embankments, uh, finishing operations, okay, and then the construction methods from our macadam for our macadam road. Here we use a hot mix, okay. We have many different types. We have wet, okay. We have a cold mix, huh? but here we we look at the uh, hot mix. So these are the uh, constructions. Uh, construction steps okay so last time uh, I, I give to them because they need to memorize it uh. now you do not need to memorize already right you just uh, do some short notes uh, not directly all copy in uh. <laughs> you cannot copy each and every uh, point here okay but uh, you can summarize it right you can summarize it and then give your own words, give the key point. That is what you can do. Okay. Okay, in the case if you need to write any theoretical type of question, okay, theoretical type of answer in your in your final assessment, okay, please uh, give a full complete sentence. Uh. You can give in point form like this, but you have to give a uh, complete sentence like for example here i won't encourage you to use uh, to, to say it in this way right you matter rollers may be used so you may to expand a little bit okay um pneumatic uh, rollers can be used okay as the uh, compaction okay in the compression uh, process you need to give in the full okay in the full uh, sentence you have uh, students have to understand, right? When I give you the notes, sometimes I may give you just keywords or key points. Uh, may not be a complete sentence. It doesn't mean that in your answer you you directly copy what is from the notes and you expect you can get full mark. Okay, it is not like that. Uh, it is not like that. Some of the students they may ask me, I I I. I write everything the same as your notes, oh, but I don't get full mark. Okay, because notes is the key points I give to you, but during the lecture, I also explain uh, more. So you have to understand the text and then express right in your own point. Okay, uh, you can use the notes as the reference, mark, okay, but encourage not to directly just copy because they might not be complete. Okay, we have more. So I believe that's all for our 
discussion today, revision today. So good luck in your final assessment. Okay, maybe I talk a little bit about the final assessment. Uh, there will be two questions. I right? total is 40 points, 40 marks. There will be two questions. Uh, each question 20 marks. Okay, uh, no choice lah. I mean, you have to answer both questions. Okay, you cannot choose. Uh, each each one is 20 marks. Okay, so in terms of theory and calculation, uh, this round not like last year. Last year is more on theory, right? This round I set it. Um, I set it maybe around um, 60, 40 or maybe 70, 30. Uh, the bigger portion is calculation. Smaller portion is theoretical. Okay. Uh, something like your test. Huh? You can see your test. Your test is, uh, I think, 90-10. 90% is calculation, 10% is only only your your uh, theoretical type of question. Okay, but in the final assessment, I think maybe 70-30 or 60-40. More on calculation, uh, less on the theoretical. Okay, so any question you want to ask? So the FA, uh, our friend go ask me, so the FA cover the topic show in today revision class? Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. Question, uh, chapter two and three is not covered. It's already in the, in the test. Huh? You have been tested a lot already <laughs> for your, for your chapter two and three. So I, don't think you need to be tested again in your final assessment. Okay, we have so many other chapters. Why I just want to focus on one or two chapters. Okay, so no. So you can save uh, some of your time. Uh, focus, okay, focus on the, the other chapters uh, that haven't gone through yet. Any other question? 